And hello, Father Marcus. Welcome to hello. your session here. I believe they've just wrapped up on the main stage and uh, we have everyone heading right in here. So I'll turn it over to you. Great. Do we know when, uh, when, when you want me to start? You are uh, welcome to start right now. Your uh, session has now begun. Go right ahead. Okay, fantastic. Thank you very much, Dominic. Good to be with you. I believe we've got just 25 minutes to be together for this, this session today, so we can't cover everything, but we can do some interesting things. I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes, and then we'll have uh, some Q&As. Uh, and if you want to write anything in the, the chat as well, please do so, because I'll be able to pick up questions from there. I will so excuse myself. Talk. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you, Dominic. I'm going to talk about the Catholic gifts to civilization. I remember the story of Catholic Voices getting started, and it was to do with a debate when Christopher Hitchens and Stephen Fry were able to um, convince a vast audience worldwide on television and at the Royal Albert Hall that the Catholic Church was a force for evil in civil for civilization. And the Catholic representatives there were pretty abysmal, and um, they didn't really present uh, what we really have offered to civilization. We know as believers that our faith is the soul of the world. And we, we mean that, of course, principally to do with salvation and the spiritual gifts that are given. But I think the idea of the soul of the world can also be applied in a more worldly and practical sense. We can actually demonstrate the fruits of the faith. Jesus said, by the fruits you shall know them. And we can show the, the goodness and truth of our faith by the fruits. It's a new way of doing apologetics. Some people call it the way of beauty or the aesthetical method. It's simply about showing what has been given by the faith to the world. And I want to encourage you to tell the church's story in that particular way, because it can have a, an effect um, beyond um, mere proclamation, a mere rational teaching about the faith. It can show people and draw them into the beauty of the faith um, using this form of apologetics. We've been masters at, the ma uh, masters at making our faith rather dull, insipid and boring, and it's taken some genius to do that when most of the good things in our civilization have come from the Catholic faith. So it's time to, to present them again. Um, Let's just talk first about fruits of the of the mind, because we can divide fruits of the faith into different areas where our faith has made a contribution to the world and to civilization. Fruits of the mind might be the first area we're talking about. Let's look at, for instance, education. The church preserved the ancient civilization of Greece and Rome and preserved it with the with the collapse of the Roman Empire, particularly through the monasteries. We owe the church incalculable debt uh, for this. Um, just think of those those monasteries keeping all the manuscripts of the ancient world. Think of Saint um, Saint Jerome uh, translating the Bible. Think of all those schools that were founded from very early on to teach people. Um, and even today, in, in England itself, more than ten percent of all children are educated by the Catholic faith. And education has been at the center of what we've, we've done through history. The university system was founded by the Catholic faith. Over 50 universities already by the 15th century. The first school and continuing school in this country uh, was the Canterbury School, founded by St. Augustine when he landed in 597. It still exists to this day in Canterbury. And these are not just minor facts. These are a major part of the story of the fruits of the mind in our civilization. And they're not just by chance that Christianity happened to be around. It's because we believe in the mind. We believe in the God who created the mind, who created um, rationality and wants us to know. And it's similar with the scientific method. Often science is used as an alternative to faith. But much of what we have today with the scientific method has come uh, through uh, Christianity and is a fruit of the faith in many senses. One need only point to the great uh, founder of the, the Big Bang Theory, Monsignor George Lemaitre, 
who first came up with that most important theory of the, of the modern age. You could speak of Gregor Mendel, the father of the field of genetics. Um, and his work in looking at genetics has been brought to a great completion in many ways by Francis Collins, the devout Christian uh, scientist who mapped the human genome. We should never put faith and science separate. We should always realize that faith and a Catholic civilization is a civilization that would be interested in the world, believing the world comes forth from rationality and that we have rational minds to study it and it's declared by God to be good. That's a tremendous recipe for science. I mean, there are atheists who do science and good science, but they don't have good reasons for doing science because they don't believe in any of those are things about rationality behind the whole universe, in us, innately, completely, spiritually. And having the reason to believe things are intrinsically good, that's all part of our faith, the fruit of the faith. Louis Pasteur once said, a little science estranges men from God, but much science brings them back to him. And whole fields of scientific theory have been invented by great Catholic figures. And not just because they happen to be Catholic, but they were inspired, stimulated by the genius of Genesis and the understanding of a God who says, I am who am. We can also speak of a vast number of philosophical ideas that have come through the Catholic faith. Just ideas that have transformed our civilization. Concepts like free will and the intellect, substance and accident, um, secondary causation, matter as good and not evil, objective and natural law, the immortality of the soul, the natural and the supernatural, the principle of non-contradiction and so on. You could go through the massive philosophical concepts that have shaped our civilization and continue to do so. And even in our notion of time, and I can see the clock ticking down, so I have to go very fast, I'm afraid. <laughs> even our notion of time has come through Catholicism, well, at least through the judeo Christian. Most of the ancient world and outside of Christianity today believes time is like a circle. But because we believe the world had a beginning, it's revealed to a beginning, and it will have an end. We believe in a Genesis and an Apocalypse. Therefore, we believe in a, a, a linear time. We believe in progress. And this has been uh, put forward by many Catholic philosophers, but also has affected the way we do history. So the person who popularized the idea of Anno Domini and the measuring ourselves in time that helps us to map history was St. Bede, the Venerable. I'm here at St. Bede's Parish right now. And he also... Um, he also gave us a fantastic notion of history. He's the, the father of, of history, the patron saint of historians. And we could speak about the Gregorian calendar, which transformed our understanding of time. Um, Pope Gregory gave us, gave us this. And it took the, the, the British government another 200 years almost to, to catch up and correct the calendar. But let's talk about fruits of the soul as well, not just of the mind. You know, I worked for a long time in Ramsgate for almost a decade um, where we founded the Shrine of St. Augustine. It's the place where Christianity first landed for the Anglo-Saxon world. And so much has come forth from that mission. I could talk about many fruits of the heart and the soul, but if I just go through one slice of it through St. Augustine's mission, when he landed with his monks, he landed with a book of the Gospels, a silver crucifix, and the monks were singing, and when they got to uh, Canterbury, they were allowed to build. And all of that transformed culture. Uh, it, and it manifested fruits of the faith that have stayed with us forever in this land. So, for instance, the, the actual letters of that book of the gospel that still exists, it's in Corpus Christi Library in Cambridge, the, those, those um, letters of the, of the, of the Latin alphabet were used by the Anglo-Saxons who had no written language. And it, it shaped their, their whole understanding of language. It allowed them to, to write. St. Ethelbert, the king of Kent at the time, was able then to produce laws, laws, um, Christian laws for the first time in history using that. There's the Textus Refensis that still exists, which is a, uh, a later copy of those laws. 
And also, um, it's just like what happened in many other places around the world, in modern day missionaries, particularly in in tribal Africa, part, uh, whole languages have been written down for the first time because of Christianity. And it happened with other uh, other groups and other alphabets were inspired by Christianity. The Armenian uh, uh, people, the, the Russian people received uh, their language from Cyril and Methodius, inspired by them. And why is this? It's not just by chance. It's because we have a written gospel. We have the Bible. And we want to transmit um, the revelation of God that's been given to us uh, in that way. And we also have literature, of course, St. Bede, the Venerable, writes about many stories to do with St. Augustine. And you have a narrative. The, the Gospels are filled with narratives. And St. Augustine of Hippo, who was the namesake, the patron saint of Augustine of Canterbury, the other St. Augustine, wrote the first autobiography of world history. And we have inspired the greatest literature in the history of the world. Think of all those marvelous figures of literature down through the ages, just in, Eng in England. For, um, if you talk about the poets of, uh, like Cademan, right through to the dream of the rude, or if you move into the medieval times, you, you have um, Chaucer or even Shakespeare. You couldn't have a Shakespeare without Catholicism. So many of those ideas are saturated in Catholicism. Graham Greene, the Catholic writer from Clapham, just around the corner from here, um, said that the other writers of his time, the other um, novelists, um, their world was filled with um, cardboard symbols and paper-thin characters compared to what Catholic writers had because they spoke about the big truths, about the big stage of time and eternity. So we do inspire literature. Augustine landed with that book of the Gospels. It had illuminated aspects to it. It had art within it. Uh, and he inspired art and carrying that silver crucifix and an icon of Christ, we're told they had as well, has inspired art. And our Catholic faith has given the world so much of the artistic heritage of mankind. Just think about just uh, right at the beginning of Christianity, when Christians were free to finally um, to to, um, to to paint and to to create art, think of those catacombs where there are depictions of Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary. Think think of the great art that developed um, in the early church, the use of mosaics to depict the divine. The Second Council of Nicaea talks about um, Christ having become man allows us to depict the divine, the holy, and the human person in a new way. And this transforms art. And from that, you get people like Frangelico, Giotto, uh, Michelangelo, uh, Raphael. It doesn't exist without the Catholic faith. And then Augustine began to build. Think of the architecture. All those great churches of the Western world, all those cathedrals, those cities, uh, are blessed by all the little churches in every town and village. The person who greatly honored Augustine was Pugin, who lived in, in Ramsgate, and he said it was the churches, the Gothic churches particularly, around England, around England that converted him to the Catholic faith. He saw in every place gems of architectural magnificence, and he began to ask the question, what civilization produced these? And he believed that if you had good architecture, it would affect the world, it changes the way we live. And the when Augustine landed, the monks were also singing Gregorian chant, fresh from the monasteries of Gregory the Great. And our musical tradition, most of it in the West, and a lot of it in the East, comes from Christian faith. Um, so St. Augustine said, he who, sings, he who pr uh, sings prays twice. And we know our Lord and the disciples sang the Psalms. And it was, it, were, it was monks that set the, uh, the language of music. Guido Varezzo gave us the very language of musical notation in, in the 10th century. And I could give you many examples of how music has developed through the cathedrals of Europe. But finally, there are also fruits of the body. Um, fruits of the body, of course, would include 
practical things like food and drink. You might think, what's that got to do with the Catholic faith? But it was the monks who gave us many of the things like beers and whiskies, developed all those wonderful varieties of cheese and wine. Did you know that if you ever enjoyed a New World wine, and some of you tuning in are from the New World, um, you, you enjoyed those, those wines. Did you know that the grape only came to the New World, to South America, to North America, through Christianity? The grape was brought with, with the Catholic faith. And it was brought because we needed the Mass. We needed to cultivate the vine for that reason. But it led to this new flowering of, 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 of viniculture. But so many other things, too. If you enjoyed a cappuccino earlier, that's a, a lovely link with, with the Capuchin monks. But why? It's not just a coincidence because we were around for a long time and a lot of us. It's because we believe the body is good and we believe the world is good. And we also do keep fasts, but it also lets us produce magnificent feasts. And the feasts point to heaven, to the beauty of a new creation. We can talk about charity. You know, when Rome was converted finally in the 4th century AD, it was decreed that in every city of the empire there should be a hospital for the poor. The Roman world was very brutal before, but after that conversion, tremendous change came about. And you know, we're the largest charitable organization on the planet. Think of the great figures like Mother Teresa or St. Francis who have inspired thousands upon thousands of men and women to give their lives in vocation to the service of the poor and the sick. And then we could talk about a fruit of the, of the body being our, our, our spirit of forgiveness. Sometimes people think apologetics is about apologizing. But it's not really about that. It's about defending the faith. But there's an aspect of it that is about apology too, because we do believe in human relationships and we do believe with a certain humility that we made mistakes through the ages. So we also apologize. And this was characterized beautifully by John Paul II, St. John Paul II, when he asked at the millennium, turn of the millennium for forgiveness for the mistakes of the church. But often we, we fixate upon those now, and the world does, and we don't talk about all the good, which is the massive backdrop. Um, and also John Paul II modeled forgiveness in the way he actually went and forgave the man who shot him and tried to kill him, Ali Abka. The final fruit of the faith, I'd say, is, is, you could say, is the, are the saints themselves. Aristotle said, you know a species properly, not by its defective types, but by the, the, the type that is working properly and functioning properly. That's, the, that's how you categorize. And our fully functioning human beings are the saints, living truly the life of God and perfectly the life of man. And they're the greatest gifts to civilization, the big ones, the small ones, people of all ages, the rich ones, the poor ones, the simple ones, the clever ones. You can all name your favorite saints. And I think they're magnificent fruits uh, to show to civilization. So be confident in the church's story. Today, we have such bad news. Sometimes we feel that we're Catholics despite the church and the behavior of its members. But these negative things, and sometimes they are horrible are just like the Judas amongst the 12. They're one amongst many, but we magnify those. But they're tiny specks against the greater, massive picture of goodness, of beauty, and of truth. And as with every melancholic person, you have to get them to see the good and be thankful, not to sink into a depression. And one of our tasks is to get people to see the light and the fruits of faith. Then they began to ask, further questions. Why the light? And then the adventure begins. That's where evangelization comes in. So thank you very much. I hope we've got a bit of time for some questions. And, and Andrea says, uh, are there some useful, a useful document for links? There's a, I, we produce a little book with the CTS and I really recommend it to you. If someone could put it in the chat, if anybody's good at that sort of thing, it's called Lumen, the Catholic Gift to Civilization. So, um, and it not only states all these areas and more of where the Catholic Church has, and the sources for that, where the Catholic Church has influenced civilization, but it gives the reasons why. Um, 
any more questions to come through we've got someone from the um the philippines wonderful wonderful to uh, to to hear from you and from valletta in, in malta their cultures with beautiful catholic faith beautiful catholic faith you know wherever the catholic faith is is planted it doesn't create a monoculture but new and wonderful things ar arise it's the same faith but they always have something unique so it's great to have people from from malta and the philippines and tell us if you're from any other places too Andrea says, other saints, St. Gregory the Great and Francis of Assisi. Yes, Gregory the Great is magnificent because he he's the one who sent the mission to the Anglo-Saxon people. And at a time when the church was was shrinking uh, and the Roman civilization was, was disappearing, the temptation would be just to simply uh, hunger down and to just preserve what you had in, in, in Rome itself. But instead, he did the daring thing. He sent missionaries out to the furthest outpost of the ancient world, to Britannia, and great things happened. So he's one of one of my favorites too. And France of Assisi, gosh, um, he summarizes so much of uh, of the beauty of the faith, doesn't he? In his simplicity, in his charity, in his his uh, affirmation of creation, and the whole world seems to sing the hymn of God with him. Sarah, good to hear from you as well. And in Walsingham, what a beautiful place. The place where Our Lady said, share my joy. And uh, we, we, have to, we have to share that joy. The world is very miserable, and it doesn't need to be miserable. Of course, the suffering in this world and the sacrifice it doesn't have to be miserable. Tolkien, who I didn't mention, is one of the great fruits of the faith, the greatest writer perhaps of the 20th century. He was a Catholic, and he said his whole concept of beauty, both in its grandeur and simplicity, came from the Blessed Virgin Mary. And he wrote to his son before he died, and he said, I put before you the one thing to love upon this earth. He said, the Blessed Sacrament. And there you will find all the glory and all the splendor. But above all sacrifice, which is the true way of all our loves upon this earth. Father Pascal says, where would you begin, soul, mind, and body? What in your experience has worked? I think it depends on your audience and the, t the, kind of the different kinds of people we deal with. Some people are just really attracted to beauty, so it's good to begin with, with, with the beautiful. Some people are quite, you know, very cerebral. It's good to begin with the fruits of the mind. Um, and some people have a, an innate kind of spiritual sense to, to look at those things. Some people are very caring, and our and and a world does have a lot of people who really want to do, do good, but sometimes they get channeled into into causes that that aren't that aren't fully fully Christian or they're all alternative to Christianity. But I think to present the goods of the body uh, to those people particularly. Um, but we are complete wholes, so we need all of those aspects. We shouldn't. Uh, fixate on one or the other uh, and I think you know, talk about the things that inspire you because they will inspire others you know I gave the example of Saint Augustine and I think it translates because I, I, I like it because I've seen it because I care about it and there'll be fruits of the faith that, that you will have a particular love for and that will transmit uh, the best. Sarah says Father Marcus uh, can you tell us more about the gifts uh, to uh, coexistence, people give the idea that the presence of a strong church equals division, whereas perhaps the opposite is true. Yeah, as people think of the church as a kind of uh, a sort of prison, you know, a mechanistic prison. You enter into it, and then you have to follow everything that's uh, uh, that, that's, said, that, that's said. But rather, the church is is more like a garden, and it allows very different things to flower and. Just as in the Garden of Eden, the, the Adam and Eve could eat of any of the trees uh, of the garden, any of the fruits, um, but just one they couldn't. So the restrictions are, are quite minor, really. The, the, the scope for, for creativity is massive. Uh, and um, the, the church, um, it, should be, it should be strong because it's a family and a family should be strong. Uh, and we... we we pray, we pray for that, and um, 
it has the capacity to shape civilization. It's not meant to be a, uh, a hidden church. Sometimes it has to be that. But as soon as it's capable of manifesting itself um, in civilization, it will do in a big way, like at the conversion of the Roman Empire. Suddenly, the church could build those gigantic basilicas and begin to transform society. And it has that capacity and that desire to do be, to do that because we're meant to be one humanity one family of god but um yeah there are challenges to that as well and um yeah i think our time's running out but we there is a really good question about accusations about the inquisition and you could you could go through a few of those and i'd love to spend time in apologetics with those um and i think they do need answering but this isn't the moment to do it because our time's running out but yes, people say, what about, you know, Galileo, the Inquisition, um, the Crusades? You get this, but there are answers to those. And sometimes the church can say, oh, no, it got that, that aspect wrong, but that's only a part, tiny part of the story. Or it can say, well, actually, uh, we've got to understand it in its context. Um, the Crusades, for instance, were defensive wars in many ways um, to defend civilization. And while they did, there were bad things that happened along the way, there's a bigger picture. I can't go into it all now, but um, do read, study about these things. I think we're being summoned back. Uh, we have a question. Uh, uh, okay, well, we've got a couple more minutes, so we'll go on. Yeah. What is your perspective of the Catholic charismatic spirituality, especially as a tool to evangelization in this largely secular world, Albert says? Um, yeah, I, I, I think we've got to use lots of different means. The church has many different spiritualities. As long as they're authentic, um, they're not kind of um, they're taking us away from Christ, from uh, and, and, and from true Catholic principles, then we, we must use them all because there will be people attracted in different ways uh, to the faith. And so, uh, yes, and I think particularly what the charismatic spirituality emphasizes is well, two things, the importance of the Holy Spirit, uh, which the Holy Spirit has been sent to, to uh, inspire us, and, and we can't, and often we've ignored the presence and the gifts of the Spirit. But second, I think the charismatic movement emphasizes the supernatural dimensions of the faith that sometimes have been buried. Uh, and the supernatural dimension of the faith, which I mean by which I mean that God is working and active and influencing the, in the world with his providence, but also with his gifts and with miracles. This world is not closed to God. To believe in science doesn't mean that, that uh, this is a, a locked and closed universe. Um, if you believe in free will and the action of spirit on matter, uh, then the, the belief in miracles is, is quite easy uh, for, for us. Any more questions there you'd like to, to bring up? Yes, I think some people have gone to the other other talks now. I've moved across because they're starting. But uh, Sarah's put a question in here. Uh, so many people are choosing Buddhism. It does have a, a beautiful aesthetic, even though it denies the reality of the world. As far as I can understand it, what can we do to draw them into reality? Yeah, this is this is a, a big challenge because people are searching for spiritual things. They know um, that materialism and our conception of just being born in this world to shop is not enough. We need much more, and there's, there's a desire for God in every human heart, a desire for for truth, for life, for love. Um, but the great difficulty with Buddhism is that it, it is, is is a search that ultimately becomes quite in, in, in tear and selfish, well, let's, let's say self-focused, um, 
that it that it doesn't lead to a personal union with with God that it's depersonal so I think the thing to present is great spirituality wonderful the the asceticism um, wonderful to see beyond the the, the physical um, the world to emphasize there's a Catholic tradition of that as well but to really focus on the person of Jesus Christ or on the relational aspects of um, the person and God the triune relationship so that's the thing to focus on um, to keep keep focused on the personal because if Christianity anything it is uber personal it begins with total relationality in God in the Trinity and it doesn't make any sense at all if it's reduced to to rules or a way of spirituality um, uh, and I think also um, also with with Buddhism I, I think it's it's explaining that if we have a God who loves us if there is a personal God there can be a, a, a world that that is good a physical world too and God can create that and while there are, there's there's limitation and there's imperfection because of, of evil because of sin because of free will the world is fundamentally good uh, and to keep emphasizing that point uh, and that is is what has given so much of the, the fruitfulness of Christianity <laughs>